Welcome back off stage radio. Thank you for joining us again. I'm your host, Chris Schnabel. And today we are joined by a football coach, which is exciting for me. You know, I'm a big football guy, so I'm I'm very excited. Dave Steckel or Coach Steck, as he said that everyone likes to call him, and I'm gonna call him that. I love nicknames. So coach, how you doing today? I'm doing awesome. I told you earlier, man. If I was a twin, I'd be any better, man. <laughs> so you've been in football for I mean, longer than I've been around even since the, since the eighties um, and you played, how did you, what made you decide to make that transition from playing to coaching and, and not go to like maybe the next step in some other way? Well, I think, you know, you sit back and, and everybody hits it. I'm sure you have. And that's why you're in grad school trying to, you know, get the next career here in sports journalism is you hit that senior year of college and you sit back and you start reflecting back on, what you've done so far in your life and your, your all your experiences. And I was in the Marine Corps um, for three years before I went to college. And I went to college and played football and I'm sitting there reflecting. I'm going, okay, I knew the Marine Corps and I knew football. So those are the only two things I really knew and loved. And so long story monotonous, I uh, decided to give coaching a shot. My brother was a coach at the time. Uh, my brother's coached 24 years in the NFL, Les Steckel, and he uh, coached college football. So I said, you know, let's give this a shot. And I had an opportunity to go to Miami of Ohio um, as a graduate assistant, work on my master's like you're doing and coach. And I just fell in love with it. So did your, um, did your brother get into coaching before you or did you guys get in around the same time? No, no, he was way before me. He's, he's the way older brother, Chris. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Les is like 11 years older, so we always have debates who was a mistake, him or me. And so you went and did your um, master's at Miami of Ohio, and that's kind of where you got your first coaching stint, correct? Correct. And it was, you know, the good Lord blessed me because it was labeled as the cradle of coaches. So I got to meet some really great, famous coaches and be able to pick their brain a little bit. It was, a, it was a great, great learning experience for a young guy. And you've been you've been to a bunch of different colleges. And I mean, I don't know much how it works. You know, I've always heard of the coaching carousel and all this stuff, but I'm not like too endeavored in it. So like when you went from Miami to Ball State to Minnesota, were you following somebody or were these jobs that you picked up after um, maybe the one stint was finished or how did you make those transitions? Well, well, let's start off on the career. You know, there's there's really, you know, sitting back and looking, reflecting back on the last 40 years of coaching, there's really kind of no rhyme or reason to a point of how you get jobs. And, and I was at Miami of Ohio, as, like I said, to get my master's, uh, applied, interviewed for some jobs, didn't get them. But then again, I got blessed again because if I would have got those jobs, I would have taken off and would have left without my master's. So I got my master's in June. And Ball State had a defensive line job open, come open very, very late. And the coach there, Dwight Wallace, was, you know, they, it was either win or get released. So there was a whole bunch of, uh, there was a whole bunch of uh, guys who said no to the job. Well, I'm a young guy. I'm thinking, okay, I can bounce back on my feet. So I interviewed and he gave me the job and I got hired in July. And then, you know, we didn't win enough. We won four games that year and got released. So, Hired in July and on the street in December. And then I, I was young enough that was and fortunate enough that I went back and went to University of Minnesota with Lou Holtz as a graduate assistant. And that was a phenomenal learning experience being around a great motivator and football coach like Lou Holtz. So it all worked out. And how'd you get, I mean, you went out as graduate assistant, but how'd you get that position? Like, how did that come about? There was a guy uh, named Pete Cordelli who coached with Coach Holtz at Arkansas, went to Minnesota, obviously went to Notre Dame with him. And then from there, then from there, he went to, uh, was a head coach at Kent State. And Pete and I bonded a friendship at a football camp. So, you know, it's networking, it's knowing people, obviously. And Pete recommended me and I met Coach Holtz in the airport. Uh, we both happened to be flying through crossing paths and he talked to me and interviewed me and a week later they hired me. And you, um, 
so you've been to you know Toledo, Rutgers, Lehigh, Dickinson. Then you spent about fourteen years at Missouri. Um, how did you get into that, and and what made you stay so long as opposed to some of those other coaching gigs? Well, what happened is you go through your tenure and stuff. You're right. I, I went to Lehigh. I, I was at Dickinson College, which was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience because the kids there were just incredible. And uh, you know, I always tease how they paid so much money to get a great education for me to yell at them. <laughs> it was Division Three. And then I had an opportunity to go to Lehigh, which is not far from where I grew up. So I went there, and then I graduate. I was a graduate assistant for a man named Dean Pease, who's now actually just got back into coaching as a defensive coordinator with a lot of Falcons. And Dean's been in the NFL with the Patriots and the Ravens and Tennessee, and now he's with Atlanta. I was his GA, and Dean was the defensive coordinator at Toledo when I was at Lehigh. And they had a defensive line job open up there at Toledo, and he called me and asked if I was interested, which obviously the answer was yes. So I went in and interviewed with him and got the job, and that's where I connected with Gary Pinkle. And uh, I left Gary and, and went to Rutgers because, you know, you're still on that trajectory going up in the coaching realm. I just wanted to be a, you know, major college coach. Rutgers at the time was in the Big East with Miami and Boston College and Pitt and stuff. So we went there for five years. And, uh, you know, there's two types of coaches, Chris. Those who have been fired and those who are going to get fired. Okay. <laughs> so we got fired at Rutgers. And, and at that time, Coach Pinkle went to Missouri as a head coach. And he's such a loyal guy. He took everybody with him. He took everybody with him, and then, uh, except for one guy, and that left an opening for me. So I went from Rutgers back to Missouri with Coach Pinkle, and the loyalty and the fun we had with the staff and building something great there is very special to stay at a place for you know five six years, and we got to stay there for fourteen years. So it was a godsend. So do you think with uh, coaching, that's kind of how? you move, move up and move around the ladder as you kind of find somebody that trusts you and, and knows, you know, their scheme and you kind of just go with them until you finally get that big break. Like then you became the Missouri state head coach. Is that kind of like how coaching works in uh, college football? I think here's how I tell young coaches when they, I talk to them is, you know, it, it's sad to say, but it's true for the most part, and I'm generalizing, but I'm at a high percentage, you get jobs and you get interviews because of who you know, the connections you make through the uh, inner networking of coaching. And coaching is a very, very honorable profession. And it's very, uh, it's like a huge fraternity to a point. A lot of guys know a lot of guys. So you, you get jobs that way, Chris. However, you keep jobs and move up from jobs based on the job that you do for that coaching staff. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is doing a great job recruiting, doing a great job of molding your players to graduate and build, taking high school kids and molding them into men so that they can go live a productive life. And then you recruit them, you mold them, and then you coach them on the field also to do the best they can, i.e. with accolades. And you start getting a reputation of, okay, not only does this guy know people, but he can recruit and he can coach. And coaching is teaching. So you, you become a good teacher. You become a good co uh, recruiter. Recruiting is building relationships. And then you s start moving up the line. And when you finally cracked that, that head coaching, um, how did that come about? How did you get to that? And do you, have you tried to get into the head coaching uh a head coaching gig before you got the one at Missouri state. I did. And I was, well, they always tell you you're the bridesmaid because no one wants to say, Oh yeah, you were fifth. So, uh, supposedly I came in second for a lot of jobs and it's just like anything as you move up, you know, uh, graduate assistants want to be assistant coaches, assistant coaches want to be coordinators, coordinators want to be a head coach. And you want that opportunity to see if you can run your own ship. So we interviewed for some jobs and, uh, didn't get them. The Missouri State job came open. It was a job that they hadn't won there since 1991. And I didn't win there, but we changed the culture there, which was very good. I mean, they went from the worst APR school 
in the country to, we were in the top of the Missouri Valley academically. Our kids graduated, which was good. Um, but a lot of things go into building a program. And I want that opportunity to try to see if I could do it. And also the big footnote was in college coaching, Chris, most, if you really analyze it, there's probably 90% or greater the coaches who get head coaching jobs are the offensive guys. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants those offensive guys who put up points. Well, I was a defensive guy. So those opportunities were far and few in between. And we had this opportunity. My biological, as Marissa Torme would say, and oh, my cousin Vinny, you know, my biological clock was ticking. <laughs> so uh, we took a chance and took the job. And uh, I don't regret it because of the relationships and people that we got to know and built there. And it was a, a great challenge. And it was uh, some good memories there. So do you think as a coach, um, looking back on it, do you think that it's a successful stint because you change the culture? Like does they obviously for especially athletic directors, wins and losses mean a lot, but changing the culture, do you think that makes it a successful stint? Uh, a very, very loaded question. And being the competitor there that I am, I want to say, no, it's not because you're paid to win football games. And, uh, you're there to win. There's no such thing in my world as a moral victory, no matter who you play. I firmly believe the competitiveness that coaches and players have. If there's a scoreboard, you play to win. You know, there's no second place ribbon in my world. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other footnote of that is I got into coaching to change people's lives and make a contribution to young athletes because I was one of those you know, misfit toys coming through. That's why I went to the Marine Corps and college and people made impact on my life. So I went got into coaching to make an impact. So sitting back and looking at it now at my age, yeah, it's a successful stint because you have kids who call and talk to you. You know, I had a player actually last night call me because he wanted me to use it as a reference. He's getting ready to graduate and wants to get into teaching and coaching. So uh, th those things and those relationships are, are lifetime long live lifetimes, you know, where in another couple of years, people will never know what my record was. However, you're there to win. And we're talking to coach Stegg. Um, so you had a book that you came out with called the fisherman, which uh, explains leadership traits to win the game of life. Can you tell us a little bit more about the book? Well, what happened was, you know, again, going back to my players and wanting them to experience a world culture, meaning not just X and O's. We want to build these kids to graduate from college, be great husbands, fathers, but be leaders when they, they move. So we in the off season have leadership classes. And we, I was fortunate and blessed to be able to bring in a guy named Inky Johnson, who's world famous motivational speaker, played at Tennessee. You know, he lost his arm in a, a football injury and became a motivational speaker. And then another man named John Gordon, who wrote The Energy Bus and The Carpenter, and he's a well-known author and motivational speaker. Well, we got to bring these two gentlemen in to talk to our team, okay? Mm -hmm. And I talked to, to John Gordon about what we do with our leadership classes. And he said, that's unbelievable. He goes, you should write a book on that. <laughs> and I literally laughed at him and I said no, I'm not I'm not that great of an author dude and, and he kept prodding me about wanting to write a book on it and I said okay John I'll make a deal with you I write the book you write the forward and uh he says you got it I'll write the forward for you so you talk about being honored and blessed man good lord blessing us with John Gordon being able to write the forward to the book <laughs> was incredible for us and it ended up being really easy, Chris, to write the book because it was, a, it was all the stuff I taught our players that I firmly believe it in my heart to help leadership and to grow. And like I said, it's the fishermen. It's leadership traits to win the game of life because football is going to end someday for everybody. And when it does, what are you going to do for your life? So it was really, that's what we try to teach our players. And I put it into a book with a story. I had a co-author of a ghostwriter, Jason Thomas, who helped me give the fisherman a, a personality and a trait. And uh, I think it's a very interesting book. It's not like most leadership books. I think it keeps your interest, 
Plus, I wrote it from a football perspective, as in, you know, it's only 88 pages. I don't know if you had a chance to read it or not yet, Chris. I'd recommend it. It's only 88 pages, you know. I'm a slow reader. I read it in an hour, you mm-hmm. know. So that's what came about with the book and why we wrote the book. And hopefully as it gets going here and people start reading it, um, it'll make an impact on their lives. So you said you did like leadership classes and stuff like that. Do you think one of the most important things a coach can do, no matter what level they're at, is is teach their athletes to become leaders? Um, I mean, obviously the X's and O's are important and stuff like that. But do you think leadership is the most important trait you could teach uh, an athlete, especially a student athlete? Um, I, I think leadership comes after. And what do I mean by leadership comes after is I think the most important trait you could teach athletes, especially young athletes, is to be accountable, to be responsible, um, to be humble, and to teach them a great work ethic. And then once that gets established, now I think those kids reach those traits. Now they make the next step to saying, okay, you know, I, I have a great work ethic. I do care about my teammates and, and people and my family. And now you take that next step into leadership because I don't think you can lead anybody unless you can lead yourself. And what do you think um, are the difference between like a team leader and a team manager? So somebody that actually leads and somebody that might just be looked at as somebody that can manage the team, but is not bringing the team forward. Well, I think there's all kinds of leaders. You know what I mean? Some mm-hmm. some take on a some take on a huge role uh, vocally. Some people take on a huge role by example. Okay. Uh, some people take on the role. Someone's got to do the work, dirty work. Someone's got to be the star. I mean, you talk. We talked earlier before we went on the air about Gonzaga basketball. You know, there's five guys out there. And, and I'm not the best. I didn't watch Gonzaga play except a couple times this year. But Timmy and, and Suggs, to me, seem like the stars. Mm-hmm. But they ain't going to do it without those other guys on the team, you know? And everybody has a role to play. And I think great leadership comes into play sometimes when you know what your role is and you fulfill that role to the best of your ability. Um, so when you, I want to go back really quick to when you were coaching, how did you decide who you wanted to bring on your staff? Like what, what attributes were you looking for from them? What kind of people were you looking for to bring there to change that culture? Well, the first thing I want, I looked for was, was men of high integrity, men of high integrity, people who are going to go out and do what they say they're going to do. And number two I wanted guys who had a great work ethic and put initiative into play where I didn't have to micromanage them and they could go out and get their job done and and take pride in their job. So that's what I looked for first was high integrity, high initiative. And then the next step I wanted was I wanted guys who um, were good teachers so that they could teach the game of football. Because if you have high integrity, you know, you're going to be able to go out and recruit and, and make build relationships, um, especially through your initiative. And then I wanted guys who could teach the game of football. So I brought and and then with with being at Missouri State, the funds there was a reason why they didn't win in a long time. And part of that was they didn't pay a lot of coaches. So I had a lot of young guys on my staff, but it was fun for me mentoring them. You know, mm-hmm. and they built great relationships with the players and sold the program and the plan to the players. We always told them we had a plan and got to execute the plan. And our coaches did a really good job of executing that plan. Those are the characteristics I looked for the co- in our coaching staff. And then I knew they would give loyalty back to the program and to the kids on how much they cared and how hard they worked. What do you think are the most important traits you can have as a coach and what are some of the most overrated traits you can have as a coach, if that makes any sense? Yeah, I'm going to burst your bubble on this one, Chris, and say, go read my book and you'll see all the traits, (laughs) you know, Um, you know, like the book says, and the preview says, you know, 10 traits, there's 10 traits for leadership in my book. And, And I think they're all important. 
Obviously, some people will look at those 10 traits and say, I need to work on this one. Um, here's how I get better at that one. I do really well at this one. Um, is there an over trait to coaching or to being a leader? Um, I, I think the, the number one thing is through all the traits, you, you have to be a servant. You know, you're, a leader isn't a guy who sits on top of the horse, you know, on top of the wagon and starts whipping the horses. The leader's down there helping walk the horses through it. And uh, I, I think that's something that people need to see and understand that great leaders jump in there and will do things that they're asking their uh, people to do, whether they're players, their assistant coaches, in the business world, people that work for them on their team in sales. You know, am I willing to do what they did, what they're doing? You know, can I roll my sleeves and go do that? And I think the worst trait of a leader is, you know, is kind of like the old cliche when you're a parent. Hey, do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. wait, wait a minute. Do as you say, not as I do? No, go do it, and I'll do, do it with you. And uh, last question for you. When, if you were to give advice to somebody that's trying to become, you know, in the coaching or into sports at all, what advice would you give them? My true advice to them would be to number one, do it because you love it. You have to have a passion for something. Okay. And sometimes these young kids getting into coaching nowadays, they see so many salaries. Okay. And they go, wow, I want to go make all that money. Well, well no coaching is, is building relationships and changing lives at the end of the day. Yes. You're being a teacher, but Great teachers change people's lives. And I think if you do that and go in with a passion to say, I'm going to help these kids because I was a player at one time and I needed help, then all the other stuff comes with it. Accolades, salary, all those things come with it. As long as you understand that you're in coaching to teach, mentor, and build relationships for the future. And then you work your tail off at it, Chris. And great things will eventually mount up and go. This coaching, what's great about coaching, it's not a microwave business. Athletics isn't a microwave business. You don't get everything right now. Okay. You got to work for it and go achieve it. So I would say get in it for a reason. What's the reason? Because I love it and I have a passion for it. And then go work your rear end off and do all the right things while you're doing, uh, following your dream and passion. Because it's not a job if you love it. You get up every morning and go to work. It's not a job. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate all the uh, information and all the, the, the um, advice that you gave us for that. Well, I appreciate you so much having me on me on here. I'm very humbled and uh, I wish the best for your career and please read my book and tell me what you think. It's only going to take an hour to read it. <laughs> yeah. You can get Coach Stegg's book, The Fisherman, on Amazon or wherever you find books. You can find us on Instagram at off.stage.radio, Twitter, Offstage Radio, Facebook.com slash Offstage Radio, and you can find us at Schnabel Productions, that's S-C-H-N-A-B-E-L, productions.com slash Offstage Radio. Make sure you join us next week. We've got Center, uh, Sarah Penner. She is an outside hitter for the Gonzaga Women's volleyball team coming on to join us that's going to be a really good one so make sure you join us next week and we will see you then thank you for joining us offstage radio